Welcome, Achievers, to your Easy Achievers Game Podcast for the week of August 25th. Thank you so much for joining me. We have uh, quite a bit to discuss today, so I don't think I have too much to open the show with. Um, I've been knee-deep in games. Started Armor Core last night, played some Baldur's Gate 3. Uh, not some, a lot of Baldur's Gate 3. Currently in Act 3, I believe. It might be near the act, end of Act 3. Not really sure. I'd have to look it up, but... I'm having a blast. Plenty of games happening, and of course, it is only getting crazier within the next week to two weeks. So, let's get into the show, and we'll be getting into more of that, of course, uh, when we get to what have you been playing. But let's start off with Rockstar. Announced in a blog post on their official website that they have acquired CFX.re, the leading community involved in roleplay and creator communities involving inside of GTA V, mostly. I don't know if they did other things, but I know that they were the leading kind of community with the role playing if you don't know what this is they actually acquired like a, I, I don't know how many people were involved in this specific situation with cfx.re but it seemed like a community thing that they did a role play i know they had like servers and they pretty much just acquired them i'm curious what this why and what their use would be maybe implementing some sort of role playing into the game or helping them come up with ideas or something i don't know it's very interesting i i know that was very big on Twitch for a while, literally. So if you don't know what this is, you would role play in GTA five as certain things. So like, let's say you were a policeman, you would literally be in a cop, you'd be cosplaying, you would talk like you were one in universe. There was rules with a lot of the servers and these things. I think there was like one main server that a lot of like uh, the bigger content creators used, but like you had to like get in and like follow the rules. You had to like play, I think a certain amount or something like this. So like when all that that like and and that so that was pretty big on Twitch, uh, for a while there and it's pretty funny. I only saw clips. I never actually watched one of them, but it seemed funny on the outset and it seemed like a lot of people just having fun role playing as people with, uh, making names and trying to be in character and these things very fun. Xbox introduces an enforcement strike system. I saw this very quickly. Um, later the, uh, last week and I was like, ah, let's let's discuss it because it doesn't seem too crazy it's just like oh you know there's like a strike system the worse it is the the uh, more suspensions you'll get you can get things for like uh and this is on the official xbox wire of course um thing you like there's brackets pretty much of like how big of a strike you can get so like there's a total of eight strikes you can get before i believe you um yeah so you're suspended for a year <laughs> if you get to eight strikes but that's you know this is pretty reasonable stuff uh, things like profanity, cheating, uh, anything that you say that's inappropriate or you harass someone or use specific slurs and these things will, of course, get you more strikes. Uh, strikes can be aged out one at a time, I believe. Uh, or you can get uh, an appeal on the suspension if you think something was wrong or something like that. So there's a whole write-up that you can read about, pretty much. The summary is actually on the very top, just detailing like, hey, these are how it works. Each strike remains for six months. It's an interesting system. I'll be curious to see if anything changes. Uh, I ha I am not in the type of place where I really have to worry about that situation anymore because I don't play in many public lobbies. And when I do, I don't hear anyone because I'm usually in a party or things are muted. So I'm not even in the situation to utilize these things. I only do stuff if something maybe messages me or something like that after they're mad because I beat them at Destiny or something like that. Moving on. NVIDIA, of course, the leader of GPUs in the computer market and a company that w has stretched their arms into other interviews, such as gaming, live streaming, and much other things like other GPU types, and they've expanded their market on that, has brought them up in this episode as their AI chips have boomed, pretty much. Uh, and I just want to quickly bring up that the company made a revenue of $13.5 billion dollars. And uh, something even more staggering, because who cares about revenue, right? We care about how much money you made, uh, pure profit. We don't really care about revenue, because, of course, revenue is before you pay everything. You pay everyone, you pay your rent, and all these other things, these expenses. So when you account for revenue, they still made $6.1 billion. All this is a uh, info courtesy of the Verges Sean Hollister. Wow. Uh... I knew NVIDIA was going off, but, like, my God, they're really 
pumping down. By the way, that's from the last quarter. Uh, so that was their there was their Q3 uh, no their Q2 quarter I believe. Um, just insanity, uh, frankly, just complete insanity was happening over at Nvidia. I know they've had this giant boom for a while, but like it seems that they just keep making more money and they expect to make even more than that in the next quarter. So they're gonna just continually consume money and just keep getting bigger and more important. Of course, they're the leading manufacturer in terms of like. Uh, using ai to up res frames and resolution and like balancing those two things to generate things they have ai like making uh frames to make things faster and all these things they have the streaming service where you can pay to stream a game off a high-end uh computer in quotes you know like a server unit and have it stream to you so you don't need to worry about having the biggest gpus ever there's so much that nvidia is increasingly getting more and more important and of course they're uh, aiding in many of the chipsets that are in our systems not all of them of course some of them use amd in these things but a lot of them use of course a bunch of nvidia architecture in these things so they're just getting bigger bigger and it's insanity frankly uh i wanted to rapid fire because i have a uh, video already up but Destiny 2, of course, had their showcase. Uh, i don't want to bore anyone if you don't care about destiny because i try not to get specific into games uh because it only applies to a certain amount of people, but I wanted to quickly go over the showcase. And remember, there is a, an entire, almost hour-long breakdown of what was announced, what is to come on this channel right now that you can go watch yourself if you'd like more of it. But they pretty much came out, detailed the final shape, pre-orders alive. They showed off new weapons, new seasons, and these things. Pretty big deal because they were pretty much kind of the first in the console space to introduce this kind of MMO light system games as a service thing they had going on. Of course, Fortnite being the major success of the genre destiny Two is no slouch and makes plenty of money and revenue. And there is a reason they were bought out by PlayStation and Sony because they know their stuff and they know what they're doing. And we're seeing them end a saga and with them being, the leaders, I would say, in this kind of avenue that they find themselves in in the gaming space. It's an interesting thing to see. I think people kind of let specific things like this go under the radar because on the outside, it doesn't seem like a big deal. But but in reality, Destiny has inspired such a change into the market. And of course, Fortnite did as well. But a lot of things inspired in the market and they were kind of the first ones to do it on a console space. So it's important to see how they handle things because we might see that spiral or spider out into the other gaming space as an example, as I think the very least you can say about destiny is that they have made examples for others to follow. I think that's clear. I think it's obvious that a lot of games that are popular are very, very much trying to be destiny in some way, whether it be, <coughs> excuse me, whether it be, uh, trying to utilize that specific loot grind that Destiny kind of has nailed with the gun feel, with all these other things. I mean, Outriders, to me, just seem like an attempt of just trying to be Destiny. <coughs> yeah, excuse me. So, to me, this is something important that we should at least glimpse at. Keep note, keep it on the back of your mind that this is happening. Let's talk about what you've been playing. Of course, this is a question I ask you at home and, of course, myself. What have you been playing? This is a game. Uh, it could be really any game that you've been playing recently. Something maybe you finished recently or anything like that. Let me know in the comments down below, of course. And you can tweet at me at EVM1000. We can have a discussion about what we've been playing. Now, I've been playing Baldur's Gate 3. Very, very deep into the game. Very much enjoying my time with it. It is a time sink uh, in the best way. It just kind of eats away at the time. You'll play it and, I, and it's 3 a.m. And, and you realize like what, is, what has happened... You'll wonder where you've been. You'll look for your wallet because you're like, you know, what what has happened to me? And it, I'm having a blast. Baldur's Gate 3 is something that, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, that I wish Bioware made years ago. And we just haven't seen Bioware come back from, from this. And this is the game that I've always wanted. This is the Mass Effect-esque, Dragon Age-esque type of relationship in this game that I love with the melding of combat, really great combat, melding with a really, really great companion system and discussion system, and of course, all of it being wrapped around Baldur's Gate and D&D &D and all these other things that make it 
something quite special and something I wish we saw uh, from one of my favorite franchises, Dragon Age, and uh, something I hope we see in Dragon Age, but uh, I am very much worried, to put it shortly. I played the beginning of Armor Core. I'm just brand new in the game. I put in about two hours. I'm having a blast. I think it's actually very, very cool. I love the look of the core, Armored Core guy that you are. Uh, so far, the story seems kind of interesting. I don't know how deep they'll go into the story. Uh, it just kind of opened up. It doesn't really describe you much. I know this is the sixth game in the franchise, so you should have some understanding if you're jumping into these games. But I really kind of went in blind. I did watch like a single video about like the lore in these things. So there might be something I am missing out. And, I'm, and I might actually watch the video again and try to learn a little bit more about this universe so I can understand what's going on. But so far, it's good. The combat feels great. I will say you do need to uh be ready for very 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 fast combat i think um the name of the game in this game is really just movement and being as agile as possible unless maybe there's i i know there's a shield i don't know how good it is but i'm sure you can get a shield at some point and maybe focus more on being a heavy brute that can absorb damage i don't know how deep and crazy the different armor cores can get i don't know how vast the different arrays that you get uh you know how how much range how much things I, i'm still in the beginning so i don't know and i stayed a lot i stayed away from this game a lot i did not want to eat any content i didn't want to experience much of the game outside of just when it was coming out what is the kind of primer in the first couple trailers like the first maybe two or three and then i i went radio silent so i don't know what's going on and i'm very excited i know it reviewed pretty well of course not as well as other from soft games uh, especially recently but you know, Armor Core was never going... I, I mean, I never thought of it as being the next Elden Ring. I thought it was just going to be their attempt at coming back to this universe, and I'm excited to play. Play more of it, I guess. And, of course, Destiny 2 is happening. I played the newest season. Um, I won't bore anyone because I talk about that a little too much, but I'm having a great time with, with the new season. Rumor Roundup. Only one this week. The Snitch. You've been listening to the show. You know this name well. The Snitch is a very well-known leaker of, of many things. Uh, no one really knows how he knows all these things, and it's very interesting. I, I love seeing him because it's like, how do you know certain things? Because it's so random sometimes. Uh, but he says, uh, he, he tweets this out. Project God of War Ragnarok DLC is on the way. Here we go. And he has a little gif from the game uh, doing a little silly stuff. And... Although I don't think many people are surprised that DLC is coming, they did technically say it wasn't happening, but, you know, I think devs say things all the time. Who knows what they're actually telling the truth of. But Snitch has a great track record. I completely believe him. I was already on the fence of, like, will they make it, will they won't. I'm, I wasn't sure. It looks like they're going to. Uh, I think you can get a little creative if you've beaten the game, what it would potentially be about. I think I know what it's going to be about, but of course I'm not going to spoil that there because it's spoil the game, but I'm excited. Not too much else to add. I do believe him. I'm curious if anyone else believes him out there. Let's start the show for the week, and I'm going to begin the show with, of course, uh, talking about a little bit about Baldur's Gate and the kind of drama-esque scenario that we found ourselves in over at Gamescom and Phil Spencer's comments about certain things. Now, if you've been paying attention to Phil's kind of interview with... Uh, uh, Dustin Legary at IGN. He was discussing some things. Uh, he was asked a bunch of questions from Dustin, a, co a, very, a couple very good ones. And he pretty much let in, is like, hey, you know, you can't get Boulder's Gate on it, right? So what is happening with that, right? Uh, will there be any sort of distinction between the Series S, Series X? Uh, will there be ways to allow for rule breakers and these things i'm paraphrasing a lot you can read his full quotes there but uh, i'm just getting us to the point where he pretty much sidesteps the question uh he doesn't really answer he does a very phil spencer way of answering it and every other ceo answers it. he pretty much sidesteps it doesn't really say much and kind of gets out of the question where it seems like he did answer the question and in reality he didn't really so he answers it they kind of move on and that's the end of it right uh, and if you uh, don't know, we covered this, I want to say, last week or the week before. Uh, Boulder Skate 3 is not coming, or uh, was not coming on Xbox uh, 
at the same time PlayStation specifically because they could not get the split screen co-op to work on the Series S, right? And as far as they understood, they had to have that mode working to be able to launch on a thing. Now, maybe it, who knows if they would have been able to get away with that if, if they if they did or could have if they released it on time. But regardless, I assume they assumed it wouldn't go through or they asked someone and they said no. So that means that this giant game, uh, Baldur's Gate 3, that I believe has a Metacritic of like 97 or 96, something like that. One of the best reviewed games of the year. Not one of the, the best game of the year, uh, reviewed wise for Metacritic, if you care about that thing, I really don't. But when you look at it from that point of view and then you see uh, PC is already out, it's coming to PS5 very soon, and then it's nothing on Xbox until they get it to work, I guess. And that was a problem, and I actually voiced my concerns about this. You're going to sit there as Xbox and say everything has to launch on Series S, and there's no exceptions. I find that hard to believe, especially when there's high, 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 high people in the industry that we, you, as a market, uh, as a market, uh, as a person in the market of console gaming and these things, not very much in lead in third place, as you like to put it, Phil. You can't make rules, right? I can't really be picky, especially especially when it comes to something like Baldur's Gate 3, something that big a deal. I was very surprised to hear this. Now, he did backtrack a couple days later. I assume they had a conversation at Gamescom. I assume Phil went and talked with them uh, because it happened very quickly. I actually have the, the thing up right now. Let's discuss this. Right here, Baldur's Gate 3 will be coming to Xbox this year with split screen removed for Series S. This is a uh, by Chris Scullion on uh, Video Games Chronicle. I'm going to read uh, straight from the uh, article here because it's very well written. And I want everyone to go make sure they check out VGC for this specific thing. Make sure you give them the click because they're very good. Larian founder and CEO Swev Vink, I believe I said that right, posted on Twitter that a solution had been found that would allow the game to release on Series X and Series S this year. Quote, super happy to confirm that that after meeting Phil Spencer yesterday, sorry, I, I forgot that was literally said in the thing. We found a solution that allows us to bring Baldur's Gate 3 to Xbox players this year still. Something we've been working towards for quite some time. All improvements will be there with split screen co-op on Series X. Series S will not feature split screen co-op, but will also include cross save progression between Steam and Xbox Series. And it also includes uh, PS5. Not really sure why it's there. I saw that later in the week that someone pointed out. Uh, split screen co-op, of course, had been the the problem where it couldn't launch on series s now it doesn't seem to be a problem i'm assuming phil walked up to them or like how do we get it on there we can't get it to work fuck it who cares ship it on there anyways uh and of course um uh this was found out and they actually link it there very well they they was found out by him specifically saying we have no exclusivity deal uh there there is no deal it's just we couldn't get it to work on series s and it does kind of back up the rumor accusation i don't know what you would call it i guess i guess it's a rumor right where series s and devs are annoyed by it and i think that seems to be the case right i mean how do you read the situation any other and if it was had to have made and this is now the beginning of the end i think of of series s and big games because if you made the the uh, agreement with them then everyone's gonna be like well you made it for them why not us uh, th this is where it stops i guess i, I don't know I, it depends on i i'm curious if they're what are the rules right so we're into uh, are, are we even bending the rules with allowing this to happen uh because i remember someone came out and said there's something in like the contract that you can't have vital things missing or something like that so like like is this not a vital mode are we stretching around the rules with this i assume that's the case i assume if this was like an indie dev and they said that they would be like ha uh we don't care uh make it work or something i'm not sure but this specific situation kind of leaves credence to the overall feeling that we got from the devs in a couple rumors and these things that the series s is annoying to develop now I find that interesting as a lot of these games also launch on PC with lower specs in these things. 
Now, I know consoles are different, and it's not just like you you click it, and you're like, oh, you know, this PC port will work on this. So we just click that, we drag it over here, we click it there, and now it works there. Of course, that isn't what I mean, but they're already optimizing for these lower specs. I, f I found it hard to believe that, like, oh, the issue was the Series S, but, like, that's stronger than a lot of the baseline specs of a lot of other things have, so... You know what's going on there now i am tech illiterate like i remind every week i don't really understand it that well that's why i don't speak with affirmity when we talk about tech specifically i don't really make broad accusations that way i'm just pointing out the fact that that seems interesting that that wouldn't work that way and of course it doesn't have to work that way but i want to point out regardless that series s not being uh being annoying to develop for but you're also making much much lower spec things work for it so that's interesting but again i know it's not the same just i pointed that out at the time at the at the same time now i'm not pointing it out and just at least bringing it up that i still would like an answer to that and i'm sure there is an answer uh it's just i'm too stupid tech wise to tell you or know or understand but specifically with uh, going back to the overall augment of like Series S being a problem, I think this is the beginning of the end for the Series S and how par parity, um, how parallel they need to be with Series X. Uh, if you're going to make the excuse for this one, we got to make excuses for other ones as well. And I think they need to be ahead of this with top devs. Why was this ever an issue? Who is out there talking with these third party people, talking with Larian, discussing things coming to their markets and their ecosystems? And this problem wasn't addressed already. That just seems strange. Were there not communication? If there's not, seems strange that there was zero communication with Larian on making sure that they have everything covered to bring their game to their systems. That's the extra work you have to put in when you're in third place, right? We, again, I'm reminded all the time how bad they're being, right? So. That just seems so strange to me that this was a problem to begin with because why didn't we have the communication up to snuff this out the moment it came up, right? If this was a problem now, what's the difference between solving it now and solving it back then? Was just not the right people to know? Did Phil not know? That seems hard to believe. Maybe he's been too busy. I don't know. Who is supposed to know these things and who's not getting that job done? Because uh, you would think leader of third party. Back to it. Uh, I was trying to find some information. I couldn't find it. But who is that head? Who Who is the problem that's coming? I'm going to have to research this further to really figure out who who would be the the Achilles heel in this situation because it seems silly to allow this to happen. When you are in such a deficit in terms of console share and these things, you have to make that extra step to incentivize developers to come to your market in the first place, right? Some people are going to be satiated with PC and PS5, especially if they have some sort of deal with something like the Epic Game Store or PS5, and they see that extra uh, hurdle of Xbox, and they're just like, eh, you know, we got to make sure it works on this and the X, Y, and Z. And if it's the problem now, God forbid it, it, ha it keeps happening in five years. And we're hearing rumors, not even rumors, Phil Spencer himself just saying straight out that he doesn't see the need for a mid-gen refresh. What does that mean? I, I don't quite understand what he means by that because he keeps saying it and he keeps making it to a point where it's like, yeah, we don't really need to, right? And I had a conversation, actually a very good one with podcast PXN host um, Dan um, that he doesn't see it happening either because the original reason that the mid-gen refresh happened was because the GPUs needed to be uh, updated for 4k and these things right that's why it kind of made more sense back then and in this situation you wouldn't really need to because there is no way to enhance it and if you mess with the cpu well that's where everything's built on so you'd have to kind of rebuild a lot of the, these these things again i'm not a tech guy so like i kind of have to really just take his word for it it just doesn't that doesn't that's there seems to be something missing there right like then why would play Sony want to make another one? Why would they make a mid-gen refresh of a Project Trinity, right? If that is real, and I believe it's real, what's going on with that? Why is why are they making one? What are they going to do, right? It. I find it hard to believe that we can't just slap something in there and make it stronger in some way and just make it cost more money, but maybe the, I am simplifying it to the point where it's nonsense, and also they don't want to release something that's $700. I know they just don't. No, Sony nor Microsoft want to release something like that. And maybe that's just the reality of the situation where if they make anything better, it's going to be prohibitively expensive and they might make them look bad. 
I don't know. I would have be interested to see in a in a situation where they have to be like, hey, look, the PS5 maybe fifty bucks. Uh, no, I don't even think it will get cheaper. Once the PS5 is phased out and they like get rid of the stock and they have the digital only model with the attachable disc drive that you could buy separately. That probably doesn't go down in price for a while still. So if we make a new thing mid gen, things going to be probably six, seven hundred bucks, right? Like that just doesn't seem like they, these things were pretty high end this time. Last time around, these things kind of were pretty low end for when they came out. And that kind of gave them a reason to upgrade it, uh, the amount of times they did and shorten it and make it smaller and smaller. Uh, I don't know. It, this is such an interesting way of thinking about the marketplace specifically and, and what it's going to look like. But that isn't even what I wanted to hit on in this actual piece of news. I wanted to talk about Baldur's Gate relationship with uh, where Larian stands right now uh, and Bioware's... <laughs> Uh, seeming downfall from grace over the last uh, decade, pretty much. But uh, I w uh, let me know what y'all think about that. I'll probably actually cut that out for the show and make that stand alone to make sure it really gets out there. But it just seems so interesting that Xbox was able to mess up something as big as Baldur's Gate 3. And it did kind of come out of nowhere, but also it was an early access. I feel like people in, in the know should have known. But we'll have to see. Speaking of Baldur's Gate and, of course, Xbox and this whole situation, Larian is someone that has become quite a big deal. And I'm thinking of making a whole episode dedicated to just talking about this situation. But, of course, we're seeing Larian kind of, in my opinion, overtake Bioware in that kind of namesake and being the leading RPG kind of makers here with this release of Baldur's Gate 3. Now, of course, this doesn't make them like the best of all time, but of course, they're behind Division Original Sin 1 and 2. Those are games that are all very, very highly rated. Of course, uh, other CRPG kind of, you know, computer role-playing games uh, as well. But to have this much of success on how prohibitive and deep this game is, is quite impressive. And they knew what they were doing with this. They knew how to market it. They knew how to really talk with people. They really knew how to push this thing. And they did a very good job from at least my point of view. And they seem to be replacing to me. And I think I think this is going to be the case very soon that they're just going to be the new players in the game. They're going to be the new Bioware. You know, they're, they're going to be the new XYZ. And it's sad to see. And also, uh, speaking of Bioware, Bioware, of course, in the news for laying off 50 people. Uh, sad, sad to hear. Uh, and I wanted to read this statement uh, on the Bioware post. Today, rather than discuss one of our upcoming, I'll share an update about the studio itself and outline our vision for Bioware's future. In order to meet the needs of our upcoming projects, continue to hold ourselves to the highest standard of quality and ensure Bioware can continue to thrive in an industry that's rapidly evolving, we must shift towards a more agile, more focused studio. It will allow our developers to iterate quickly, unlock more creativity, and form a clear vision of what we're building before development ramps up. This just seems like so much garbage. To achieve this, we find ourselves in a position where change is not only necessary, but unavoidable. As difficult as this is to say, rethinking our approach to development inevitably means reorganizing our team to match this studio's changing needs. As part of this transition, we are eliminating approximately 50 roles at Bioware. That is deeply painful and humbling to write. We are doing everything we can to ensure the process is handled with empathy, respect, and clear communication. That last night, I want to take a moment to explain how we got here, blah, blah, blah. So they go on to say what's happening, what's the immediate impact, what comes next in these sort of, sorts of things. We're going to highlight things. So, like, what's happening now? After much consideration, careful planning, there's a long-term vision to preserve the health and better enable us to do, do what best, make these single-player games with rich worlds and all these things. Um, of course, making sure Dragon Age Red Wolf is an outstanding game with its future. Uh, including the success of the next Mass Effect, right? So, they, so they're so they making sure Dragon Age Red meets expectations in Mass Effect, and this is kind of their entire plan, right? They're really centering around making these two games really worth it. And uh, they, they go on to be pretty much like, hey, we're choosing now to act. The immediate impact, if you're wondering how all this will impact development, they're clear that our dedication to the game was not wavered. Our commitment remains steadfast. We are making, uh, working to make this game worthy of the Dragon Age name. We're confident that we'll have the time needed to ensure Dreadful reaches its full potential. I can tell you that every member of our team, even those departing Bioware, deserves credit for crafting a spectacular experience. Interesting point there. Then what comes next? 
While this is an extremely difficult day for everyone at Bioware, we're making changes now to build a brighter future. We're excited for all of you to see what we've been building with Dreadwolf, a core veteran team led by Mike Gamble, continues their pre-production work on the next Mass Effect. Jesus. Our commitment to quality continues to be our North Star. As clear as it sounds, there truly is never a good time to enact changes like this, but we trust that we have the right leaders and team in place for these things to have a world-class Dragon Age and Mass Effect experience that our fans will love. For now, I want to thank everyone at Bioware, past and present, for making the studio what it is. Gary McKay, General Manager of Bioware. Of course, there's a full statement you can read uh, on their blog kind of website thing that you can do, of course. But there it is for you all laid out to bear. And it just reminds us that one, Bioware has really, really, really had problems in the last decade to one, find a vision, find someone to lead them and find a direction that is suitable for what they have, right? We all know Anthem was terrible. We all know what happened with Anthem. No one, you know, looking back, e easy to pile up on them. Same with Mass Effect Andromeda. Although I still attest that game isn't as bad as everyone said it was, but it was so bad because it was a Mass Effect game. I understand why. It's just that game wasn't as bad as it was. Of course, EA bugs all over that game. Now, the timing is almost sickly, ironically funny, right? Like, not funny in the haha -ha sense. Funny as just dark fun. Like, dark funny. Like, the, the moment Larian has this giant success lauded as the leading success in the rpg genre right uh we're seeing bioware have to lay off people and i think it's obvious that they're just needing to cut costs they haven't released a game in way too long and they're taking their time with dragon age to make sure it's good and i understand that but that also means that you're going to take loss in money and revenue and bioware i don't think they'd be closed but bioware is still bioware ea will never do anything to that studio just because of the name and they'll look they will look very bad if anything does happen but i, I bioware is really make or break on like are you still bioware or are you just this shell kind of shambling along trying to make it to the next game and i hope beyond hope that bioware is still bioware and they can lead it Everyone Rid pretty much is gone, and they haven't really had that Neil Druckmann, right? Uh, of course, Neil Druckmann didn't start off at Naughty Dog, right? He's just, he, if you ask somebody that, they probably would think that, but of course he has. They they don't have that Neil Druckmann. They don't have the, the, um, the, the, uh, Cord Bollock is a bad example. Um, yeah, yeah you, you get what, uh, where I'm going with. They don't have someone, in my view, to really grab everyone by the horns and go like, hey, this is what we're doing. This is our vision. This is how we go. Uh, they've missed twice, right, in the last decade and a half almost. Um, not decade and a half, but, you know. And it's becoming troublesome and worrying. Are they going to be able to hit Dragon Age? We saw that leaked content, uh, that the leaked uh, little video that showcased the game. That does not look like Dragon Age. That looks like something that you're trying to sell to the masses and there doesn't seem to be a vision. You're telling me that that's Dragon Age? That tells me you don't know what Dragon Age really is. Uh, Dragon Age is more than a world. You have to really nail what Dragon Age wants to be in. That is a CRPG like Baldur's Gate. You see where I'm going here, right? And Larian is out there just killing it here and we seem to be struggling to follow suit. And now they have an example to go off of. Uh, or at least they have an example to, that they're going to be um, compared with, which is, I'm sure, terrifying for them. Uh, because Baldur's Gate 3 just came out and might be win Game of the Year, where Zelda launched in the same year. It won't, but it might. It definitely will win in some sites. And I just find that incredibly interesting. We're fi we find ourselves where... And I found myself, especially you saw me on these shows saying what happened to Bioware when that leak happened. I wanted I was in disbelief at what I was looking at, like this God of War wannabe kind of thing. I It was very upsetting. Seeing this is even more upsetting, seeing them having to lay people off. And it's just that's not Bioware, right? Bioware should be the the team that leads and gr and doesn't lose talent, begs people to come to work there and something happened. Anthem happened, Mass Effect and Drama happened, 
all their all everyone left. No one you don't go to Bioware to make a game as a service, right? That's why everyone left. That reminds me of um uh there was a story we covered on the show a while ago. Um it might have been Anthem, actually. Uh but people leave studios. No one went to Bioware to make a games of the service. No one. No one went to Bioware and was like, you know what I want to make? I want to make like Destiny game. No. They they wanted to make a single player RPG. When you deviate from the plan, people are gonna be like, I'm leaving. I'm sure that's the problem with me and Monaco currently. But they've been doing dreams for the last 15 years or something like that. Um and the problem with doing something like that is you lose your talent. People didn't, you know, people who were at Mini Monaco were like, yeah, we're making this. It was like, well, we kind of want to go make games. So you're going to see people leave. You're going to see giant percentages of numbers like, we're getting out of here. We want, I, I, I need like to make a game, not like this thing. So will we see them rise to the task? Only time will tell. I'm worried. I think it's obvious uh, with the amount of times I bring them up, but this is troublesome. I hope to see them figure this out and be Bioware because that's what they deserve. They, I mean, they were the lead. I mean, they made Mass Effect. That's one of the most special games I've ever played, the trilogy. And to see them do what's happening now it makes me sad. Moving on. Microsoft, in a bit to appease the UK's competition uh, board, they have made a bold move to try and alleviate concerns on the cloud market. They have signed a deal with Ubisoft to sell the cloud streaming rights of all current and new Activision Blizzard PC and console games released over the next 15 years. Microsoft President Brad Smith released a statement about the, about the, deal, sorry, about the deal, stating, quote, As a result of the agreement with Ubisoft, Microsoft believes a proposed acquisition of Activision Blizzard presents a substantially different transaction under UK law than the transaction Microsoft submitted for the CMA's consideration in 2022. As such, Microsoft today has notified the restructured transaction to the CMA and anticipates that the CMA review processes can be completed before the 90-day extension in its acquisition agreement with Activision Blizzard expires on October 18th. End quote. Whew. So, interesting wrinkle in all this, right? So now you'll be able to use Ubisoft Plus cloud stream and still play the game for the next 15 years so it seems like playstation isn't losing anything now right am i crazy here uh it seems to be the case as long as this goes through and everything's signed off on it, it looks like the cma not still might not approve this which is pretty crazy to say the least but that might be the situation here who knows i think they will might approve it now i'm not i'm not very sure but a uh, very bold move by Microsoft, showing that they want this done. They want this done. That is a huge, huge piece of paper that they signed that says, we will let you have cloud uh, streaming rights for the next 15 years. Let us buy these guys so we can start the train of Call of Duty, King, Candy Crush, all these things, add them to Game Pass, make them disgustingly cheap uh, as on the service and I don't have too much else to add here as I've said all I need to say about this over the last two years. This has been happening, something like that. So I'll move on. If you remember a few weeks ago, a mysterious backer annulled a deal at the 11th hour, hour involving the Embracer Group. The Mega Cola Army came in giant with over with around 131 studios under their below. Well, we have found out via Axio sources and written by Stephen Still who that mysterious backer was. The Savvy Games Group, better known as the Saudi Wealth Fund, that is backed by the country of Saudi Arabia and the royal family. Uh, the group seemed to have increased, uh, wanted to increase their footing into gaming into the publishing side of the Embracer Group, but it seems that they decided at the last second to back out which is very interesting in multiple ways that we're about to discuss uh and it seems to be of course that deal mounted at about two billion dollars of funding there's so many things wrong with this right so embracer group needs cash flow right because of the aforementioned 130 something studios with what was it like 200 ips or something in develop some nonsense number that they said it, they, they, this doesn't even seem real anyways it looks like salva games you came in they it's it's hard to really express how much money 
the, the Saudi royal family has. But let's just say that they could probably piss that money, right? They could they could literally burn two billion and probably not really matter. So it really tells you something that they backed out of this. That seems much more dire than I thought previously. Right. Embracer Group, I was like, yeah, no, this probably doesn't work out in like 15 years. They're probably gone. They just are not going to have the funding. They will not have the money. They will dry out there. They can only do so many rounding funds with all these backers and these things for cash. They're going to not have the cash to live. Right. The people is going to probably what's eat them and the, the rent in all these studios. For the Savvy Games group to look at them and go, we're not giving you a dime and backing out is quite literally crazy. And what kind of hints at how bad it is, if you really think about it, there was probably a clause that, you know, or maybe they didn't sign anything yet, that they were like, you know, yeah, we're going to look at this. And, and at the very last minute, they, they go to sign and maybe some information they got were like, you guys are not the ones we're giving money to that i mean really think about that really think about how wealthy saudi arabia is right now of course you, they don't have the unlimited card right but they were allocated funds that we talked about at the beginning of this year for specific uh things that to to buy people now of course that two billion was not to buy them but that they have plenty of money i want to say that was like for Oh my God! What, was it like sixteen billion dollars, something that they had allocated specifically to acquire things? Uh, and we haven't really seen much of that yet, so I'm still curious what they're doing with that. But they still have that just chilling there, uh, as far as I understand. And they backed out the last second. That tells me a lot about what Embracer Group is gonna look like. They probably look like a mess if you like look under the hood, and. Uh, it's not really a surprise. Is anyone surprised? You just can't do this. You, it, you know, anyone can really guess this. I don't think I'm saying anything prophetic here. But when you look at Embracer Group, you look at what they're doing, you look at their plans and these things, it just does not... You're not going to make the money you need to make to house that many studios by releasing a SpongeBob game, no matter how many release, right? So, good luck. Have fun. The Xbox 360 store is closing next year. This is via uh, Video Games Chronicle, I want to say. Or is this the Xbox? Yeah, yeah, Video Games Chronicle. It looks like the thing is having issues loading. So we're going to actually go to get a different news story. One second, cheers. I, I, of course, am saddened by this. I would love to see them try and make this stay alive somehow with, like, How do I how would I say this Xbox store closing? Um maybe like taking the store and putting it in the Xbox One with all the backwards compatibility still a thing or something like that. And I'm sure that's probably the plan. Oh, let's see here. Uh da, da, da. yeah, so here we go. The Xbox 360 store is officially closing this game spot. Uh Microsoft is confirmed that it will uh it will close July 29th, 2024. At this time, you will no longer be able to purchase games, DLC, and other entertainment from the store on the Xbox 360 or the Xbox Marketplace website. The Microsoft Movies and TV apps will also stop working on July 29, 2024, so anything in your library won't be viewable after that date. Backwards compatibility titles will thankfully remain available to purchase and play on Xbox One and Series S and X after the 360 store closes. Now, I know that is the uh, what I was about to say, but what I mean is somehow take that store and just plop it into the Series S and X. I know that is easier said than done but something to really preserve these games and really keep them going i know a lot of these games are just who we don't know who owns them the person who owns them isn't interested i i'm i believe that they probably have done enough work to really know like what's coming what's staying what's going and i imagine they probably expended that resources or at least expended it what they cared about but it would be it'd still be cool for something like that i would love a clause added to like the current thing where it's like if you cease to exist or something, we're able to continue to sell your your game or something. I don't know. Something to that nature, similar to what they kind of do with music and games now, where it's like they can use it in perpetuity. I'd be curious to see if there's some sort of clause like we added that stores can now hold systems in perpetuity or games in perpetuity unless X thing happens. Or I don't know. I, that might be a terrible deal, but I would love to see that. 
we finally got to see the PlayStation uh, Project Q, or, of course, the uh, now aptly named PlayStation Portable. It will launch later this year at $199.99 and is their first remote play device, is what it's called. It is a remote play device. It is not called a portable device. Now, the Pulse Explorer wireless earbuds and the new Pulse Elite wireless headset was also revealed. These are all lossless, low-latency audio using new PlayStation Link technology. Now, important to note, PlayStation Link technology is replacing Bluetooth. So they are. this thing cannot Bluetooth do anything. You cannot Bluetooth it to your headphones or anything like that. You have to, if you want audio in an earbud or a headphone, you have to buy these two things and link them via this whatever link technology, which is definitely not just Bluetooth, but they wanted to make sure to make all the money off of audio accessories. I'm sure that's not the reason. I'm sure it's because there's some sort of a special tech that can't work, blah, blah, blah. Now. Here are some of the details via the PlayStation blog. PlayStation uh, Portal Remote Player brings the PS5 experience to the palm of your hand. It includes the key features, DualSense wireless controller. Of course, the controller is a part of the system, including adaptive triggers and haptic feedback. The vibrant 8-inch LCD screen is capable of 1080p resolution at 60 frames per second, providing a high-definition visual experience that I expect from high-quality games created by working with that. And uh, there is a 35 millimeter audio jack for wired, wired audio, so if you want to do wired you can still do that uh let's see here uh it can of course play supported games that are installed in your ps5 um it does not have to be connected to your local wi-fi on the same network uh i'll be curious to see how well that works uh because that was everyone's worry that this thing you would have to just play it on the same wi-fi you don't have to apparently uh, and then this is more about the earbuds, which actually the earbuds do look kind of nice, to be honest with you. Uh, I'm not buying these things because the, let's see here. Oh, yeah. So the PlayStation Elite, or sorry, the Pulse Elite and Pulse Explorer are part of the ongoing efforts to amplify I mean, like the gameplay experience. Uh, Pulse Elite will be available for $149.99 and, uh, USD, and the PS uh, and the Pulse Explorer will be available for $199.99. And then they'll have more details about pre-orders and launch dates soon. Those, I, the Explorers look pretty cool. <laughs> like the uh like the really tiny ones yeah those look sick um uses no wireless technology and all that and uh that's pretty much i mean that's pretty much it it looks cool i'm not buying this thing because i have a phone with my um what it was it called uh backbone that i can just use so i don't really need this thing and also i don't use like remote play enough to justify like needing this thing uh I can just use my phone. So it's not a big deal to me. Uh, I'd be curious to see if this there's a market for this. Uh, I, 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 I actually wanted this. Like, this is the version I kind of wanted because I know they're not going to make a portable. But, like, can we make it a little beefier so it's, like, a little better? Like, I just highly doubt this $200 thing is going to really bring a premium streaming experience. And also, it's a 1080p screen. It's like, we can't go the OLED on there. Like, let's make this thing like 350 and make it like super beefy. Like, make it this big old thing similar to like a Steam Deck that can like play some things like natively. Not everything, but like some things maybe. I don't know. But I just hate that it it's just this option and it can't be like like half and half or something. Maybe it can play some games and not all. You know, I don't know. But it looks cool. Glad to see it. Uh, oh, another, another quick note. Sony did acquire... On, Sony acquires... I hope I'm pronouncing this right. Audis? Audis? They are a very, very high-end audio company. And Sony bought them. Pretty much it. Not it's they do they do high end gaming headphones specifically. Um, I think very high end. I think like six to eight hundred dollars maybe. I've never I've I, I've never seen them, so I actually don't know. Let's see. Uh, damn. Excuse me. Oh yeah, yeah. Looks like the lowest one's like three hundred bucks. So these are very high end. Uh, I saw one for like seven hundred dollars. So these things are expensive. Uh, cool. Um, I'm interested to see. Uh, 
why Sony was it was Sony is Sony no longer the I know they've fallen a lot in the other avenues that aren't PlayStation. They are really struggling, and I if I remember correctly, in in my uh, reading and all this thing in my memory is serving me correctly, they're really struggling in the TV market. They're kind of struggling in like the music playing industry as well. So I I when I heard this, I was like, but aren't but you're Sony, you you. Why do you need to buy them? I'm curious why. I, I, I assume it's for maybe like they have like maybe the distribution or something that they have that they want. Like I'm curious what they want out of them. Is it just that it's like, hey, we just fell behind so much that we just need this easy way of of having these high end uh, things. So we because they like the margins, maybe like because I know margins on headphones and these things are pretty fucking good. So maybe that's why I don't know. Curious to know what everyone's thoughts are in the comments. Let's talk about. Uh, no, let's talk about the. Oh, and the video GeForce. Oh, sorry. Jesus. What are we doing here? Date updates. That's the show for the week. NVIDIA GeForce Now gets its first 19 games to the service today. DC Universe Online will be coming to PS5 and Xbox Series S and X this holiday. Age of Empires 4 Anniversary Edition Shadow dropped on the Xbox during the Gamescom Showcase, or opening night live for Gamescom. Sonic Superstars has been dated, and the rumor in October, 20, uh, October 17th, 2023 date was true. Lord of the Rings Return to Moria releases on PS5 and Windows PC via Epic Game Store on October 24th, and comes to Xbox uh, early 2024. Did I say PS5 and Windows PC? I think I am pretty sure it did. comes to those things. And that game looks terrible. Fallout TV show coming in 2024 to Amazon Prime. People are really excited. They saw like glimpses and stuff of the show. Eh, I'm fine. I'll wait till it comes out. It, Amazon Prime makes me excited because I, I like a lot of Amazon Prime shows. So I hope it's good. Now, of course, we got to talk about what's cued for the week. Now, this could be a game, a TV show, a movie, a podcast, a comic book, a book, really anything. What do you guys have queued up for the weekend? Of course, comments, tweet at me, etc. Now, I've got Baldur's Gate 3 queued. I'm playing that religiously. Uh, I'm having so much fun. I'll be going into that. More Armored Core 6, really delving into that game, really learning it. I don't think I've learned the game. I, I do think I know what I'm doing, but I haven't learned it. I played, like, an, like I said, like two hours, so I need to really get kind of comfortable in that game. Destiny, more Destiny, just prepping for that raid. I'm very excited to to do that raid September 1st. When I see y'all, I will not have Starfield yet. So it will be. Yeah, so I'll be on the cusp of Starfield. So I'm very excited for that. The next week, we are very close to Starfield. I cannot wait for more Starfield stuff. Until then, of course, I have been Elijah. You have been a beautiful listener of the Easy Achievers Gaming Podcast. I cannot wait to see you again next week. Again, remember, tell me what's queued up. I don't have too much else to add. Thank you so much for listening. And again, remember, go achieve.